everything is working. I uh, just want to make sure everything is good. Got to get on, on the right channel here. Oops. Got to get on the right channel here with my crew. Hope everybody's doing great. I just love Thursdays. I do. Hopefully you started your day early with me on Instagram for my little uh, talk about judgment. Don't know if you guys caught that. All right, looks like everything is great. Thursday live office hours with Andy, helping you build a career you love. Get in the chat, say hi. Let me know where you're from. Let me know what you need. Let me know what you do. Put some question marks in front of your questions. The more you can tell me in those 200 characters, the better I can help you. I got a a, a, a a little package for you today. Actually, it's a couple of little couple of little packages. I'm uh, I, I, I I know I've talked to you guys about the excellence planning that I do each day, where I challenge myself in five areas. If you haven't uh, heard about my excellence planning, hopefully you can catch it on. I've shared it on Instagram. I've shared it on YouTube. And one of the things that that I, I think about is how I can better serve my community, how I can better improve certain things that I do, every thing that I do, operate a business, the way I serve you guys, the way I market my services, the things I should be not doing, the things I operate systems-wise to run my business, all that good stuff. And I was thinking about the format of, of this show. And you know, a lot of times we'll do either straight Q and A. Sometimes we'll do I'll do a lengthy teaching portion. Then we'll go into Q and A. And I I think I wanna I wanna start tinkering around with little segments of things that are are on your mind. And and uh, I know you've heard me talk about my job search boot camp. And we have a lot of job search boot camp members. They get online support. They submit questions to me every day, which I answer. And I I, I peeled out a couple that I. I really think are great topics for us. I want to I want to talk about these today. So 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 a couple things and and one is on offense today. One is on defense. These are two separate, completely separate things. But they're things I want you to be thinking about this time of year uh, as you as you go into interviewing. Because I know there, that well, contrary to what a lot a lot of people think, this is the best time of year to job search. And I've been sending you messages to this effect. Uh, we're going to be spending five days in a row at my Job Search Challenge live event, November 16th. If you have not uh, signed up for that, please, please do. It's really, really going to be a great event. A uh, lot of live time with you. I'm going to be spending something like 20 hours live with with the with with the community and with my boot campers that week alone. So, all right, I want to get into a couple of of, of things that I want to talk about. And you you might have heard me talk a bit about um, you know great brands healing quickly. We talked about this a little bit last week. And, and, and that's true. Uh, or I had this little, uh, the, this card about these, these things that I wanted you to do about helping you and creating your brand. And the, if you have a solid brand, whenever you trip up, you, you, you heal quickly. This was the, this was the card that I, that I was uh, talking with you about one of the elements, the things that I wanted you to focus on, but it got me thinking about, uh, when you're, when you're actually, I want to talk about when you are interviewing with organizations, there are there are things about your evaluation of the organization that I want you to notice. And this is, you know, are you picking a good organization for yourself? Now the one thing that I want to I want to point you to is when you get into these interviews, now I coming to you as not just an executive recruiter and a career coach, but before I was a career coach and an executive recruiter. I was a man. I was in a management uh, and information technology consultant. And during the 18 years or so that I did that, I consulted to more than 150 companies, helping them improve their processes, their technologies, and those kinds of things. In in that segment of my life, along with the recruitment that I've done for another 15 years. It's been something like 350 companies that I've looked at. So I, what I'm about to tell you, I can say with a good degree of certainty, 
that when you look at the at organizations and the way that they approach things, uh, much like your good brand and companies with good brands heal quickly, but organizations that are relatively poor, they 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 do they do this. They they seek the quick fix. So have you ever noticed maybe your organization or or one that you interviewed with? When, when, when an organization tends to be in one crisis mode after another, after another, they tend to try to band-aid things. Like they're always in short-term hyperventilation mode because something went wrong and they now need to fix it immediately. Uh, somebody left, surprisingly. Now they're trying to hurry and hire somebody. A system broke, so they're band-aiding it. It's kind of like I live in the you know, the Chicagoland area where I used to live in the city of Chicago and it would be like, I would drive down the streets and I would have to drive slowly because I was worried that I would hit a pothole and it would, you know, hurt my tire and break my, my rims or whatever. Like in, in, the, in, the, in the city of Chicago, they would just, you know, pothole one after another. And before you knew it, you were basically driving down what felt like a, a rocky road. That's what bad companies do. So when you get into these interviews and you're thinking about, well, Am I joining a company that's that's in this perpetual mode where they're constantly seeking quick fixes? The thing that I want you to do is I want you to start paying attention to why they're in the positions they're in. So questions like this that you are going to need to an ask them, you know, well, why did that happen? How, how did that occur? But why is that important? What are you doing next? What would be next? You need to start looking at your line of questioning along these lines a multi multi part questions to what it is the organization is doing why they're doing it why they're in a predicament they're in or why they're in the growth situation they're in right so 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 as you start to go into these interviews and you start to get the opportunity to ask your questions i want you to make sure that you are not just asking the basic questions and you are not just asking questions that I've coached you to ask in a number of my videos. In, in, the, in the interview intervention book, we've given you 39 great questions to ask. And if you buy that inter, or, uh, interview intervention free book package, buy it for the seven bucks or the chip in the seven bucks or whatever, and we send you an extra ebook with 75 great questions. It's not just about asking those questions and the mechanics of asking them and trying to get the superficial data that, that those questions could yield, but the smart job seeker and the real investigator is looking beneath the surface as to, it's the iceberg effect, so to speak. So it's not just what they're telling you, it's not just what they're showing you, but are you truly getting it? Are they making quick fixes? Do they seem to be going into one crisis after another. And as a matter of fact, for your own employers, for those of you that are employed, is this happening? So it's just an indication. Now, one other thing I want to say about this is the opposite is true as well. So while I say bad companies seek quick fixes, so too do job seekers who make poor choices about the organizations they join. So perhaps you've just been let go. Maybe you are getting tired of your job search and you're willing to take anything. Maybe you are doing just fine in your role and an opportunity comes up and you make a quick jump. So for whatever reason, I want you to be careful that you yourself are not falling victim to the quick fix syndrome. I, I, I hate my boss. I hate my life. I'm not making enough. I don't feel appreciated. And then just jump. Now, those are all good reasons for you to want to investigate opportunities. They are. I, to I totally support that. What I always grow concerned of is any, as a recruiter, any job candidate that I have that is in dire need to make a change, they usually become more susceptible to that quick fix syndrome where they just want to, they just want to solve it quickly because they just want to change because they don't like their situation. To that, I say to you, I want you to get ready, get your requirements in order, get your needs in order, make sure you're thoughtful about why you're changing, make sure you're evaluating what you currently have so that you're really taking stock of your current situation and you can be thoughtful. I do not want you 
to be you know the the analogous job seeker of this right bad companies make quick fixes i don't want you as a job seeker to make a quick fix and put yourself in and in, in push a bad position that you are going to have to rectify again in in the short term so i just i want to call your attention to that all right watch out for organizations that seem to be making quick fixes are you getting into an organization that has a healthy track record of supporting its employees, of supporting its customers, and those kinds of things. So be really careful, all right? That's that. That's one thing that I wanted to share with you today. I hope you guys are getting in. Put some question marks in front of your questions. I want to go on to one other, one other thing that uh, Raphael, uh, one of my boot campers, asked me, and it's really a common theme. I'm getting this a lot. I'm getting it in the live office hour shows. I'm getting it in the system. I'm getting it from the boot campers. Uh, and, and other people in the community groups too. Hmm. I am fully locked and loaded today with a triple shot latte that I just made. It's amazing what I can do between 10.57 and a half and 11.00. Hmm. All right. Let's talk about um, something else. I, uh, I got some questions a couple weeks ago on... You know, I'm in, I'm in this interview and the organization is asking me if I've managed remotely, managed people remotely. While uh, I've managed people, I haven't really necessarily done that. Uh, that was Chris, one of our boot campers. And then I got one the other day, Raphael, he said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in this interview and uh, you know, I've, ma- I've managed people and I've managed sites and I've only managed a couple of different locations and the employers seem to be overly hung up with the fact that there are eight different locations and haven't I managed that many I had another uh, another one-on-one uh, coaching client her uh, she was interviewing uh, for an organization that uh, I think it was about 500 people that they wanted her to manage she had on- only managed only managed 180 so you know these kinds of things they come up now and and they're coming up more and more now that employers thanks thanks to the 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 pandemic are are becoming more open minded about hiring people in different geographies uh they they're taking uh, chances a little bit more on people who don't have all the requisite skills that they need. So I want to draw your attention to this. What do you do when you're in any one of these situations where you're in the interview? They don't necessarily, you don't necessarily have exactly what they need, meaning to the extent that they want it, because that's a lot of what happens, right? Think about when you are in an interview. I always say you're you're qualified. Otherwise, you would not be there. Theoretically, right, the employer says by the very fact and nature that you are interviewing for the job, you are qualified on paper, right? They've seen enough on paper where they now want to take their time, their own, their, invest their own time to interview you. So how is it that you get in situations like Chris and Raphael and, and Joy, right? You, 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 you. They've seen your resume. You don't quite have, or maybe that you're clarifying. You don't have to, to the extent that they want. What is it that you should do? Now, I've talked before about this, where I've talked about this in interview intervention. It's one of the key questions that you you can be asked by an employer. How do you educate yourself? And while it's not exactly that question, uh, in 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 my book, I talk about showing the employer and talking about what you know, not what you don't, and all that good stuff. So I go into that in the book. I also have a video out there on how to get the job when you lack the experience, where you want to explain to them very quickly that while I don't have this, here's what I do have, and here's how I get up to speed, and I go into all those techniques. But ultimately, and you can check those out, but ultimately when you get in a situation where you do not have exactly what they need and you are in meaning you are in the interview so this is not about them reviewing your resume and they ask you and you're put on the spot the last thing that i want you to do and the biggest mistake you can make is start diving into and defending your background you don't need to do that you don't have that experience there's not it doesn't do you a lot of good to talk about the fact that you don't have that what i do want you to do is get their mind more on 
how you will do something. Now I've talked about this before, right? Hey, you don't, you don't, you don't have exactly what I need. You've only managed two sites, not eight. You've only managed 180 people, not 500. You've managed people, but you haven't managed them remotely. Blah, 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 whatever it is. Well, if you're over here, you're in defense mode. So what you need to do, right? We've talked about you're in the past. You want to get them to the future. But it's a very easy way, and it's a prime way to be able to introduce the fact that, okay, well, hey, uh, yes, I, I've managed multiple sites, but I think it would be a, it would be good for us if we talked about how, how I would approach that in your environment, how I would manage those eight sites, how I would manage people remotely, how I would manage those 500 people, and get them talking about that. Because this over here puts you on offense. This allow over here how you will allows you to sell, allows them to envision what it would be like if you were in that instance. And even though you haven't done this exactly this way under these parameters or these circumstances or for this product or for this service or for this geography or for this many people or this many sites or whatever, this here is going gonna, is gonna to get them dialed into, oh, she's got it down, he's got it down. That's good enough. I know they'll be able to handle it. That's the mode you need to get them in. And so I've talked a lot about this being a key tip. I got a whole video dedicated to why you want to get them into the future. But this is this is becoming more and more prevalent nowadays as you start to interview for these remote positions or you're doing more remote interviewing where you are going to have to do that. So I want, I want you to be mindful of that. Now, one thing I'd like to add. So a lot of what I just shared with you, I've talked about before in previous videos. But one thing I want, I want you guys to do, take, take this a little step further. So one of the things that I do when I am working with somebody who is preparing, so I talked about that woman, 500 people they wanted her to manage, but she'd only managed 180. Well, one of the things that we do is I'll look at the job description or she'll define the job for me or I'll think about the company or I'll think about a senior executive like this and what she might be facing. But I will literally interrogate her and poke holes. And, and you, ever, you, ever, right, you ever watch the dramas and, and you know, or, or maybe this has happened to somebody where you know, you're going to get on the witness stand? And what do they do? They, you basically have a mock trial. You ever, do you ever go into a speech debate or maybe you've heard about uh, right, the, the debate prep, and you've got your own team there, you know, hitting you with the questions and catching you and, and poking holes in the areas where you're weakest. All right, I need you to do that to yourself, okay? If you don't have me sitting there doing it for you. So get the job descriptions, do these mock runs, and then interrogate yourself. Actually, this is really good. Who knows your weaknesses better than you do? Probably nobody. You're, you're probably worried that they're, that they're finding all these, and chances are they probably won't. But they, they're going to surface some. And if you look at, hey, here's my resume, here's my background, here's what I know, here's the job description, and you run through it, literally run through it, fine tooth comb, marker, whatever you need to do to chop that thing up. Where throughout that job description could you have holes? Do you not have as many years as they're asking for? Do you not have as, 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 as much experience in their industry, in their market, in this role? Just keep going through it and making sure where could they poke a hole at me? What, what would I say if I was asked this question? A lot of people don't do this. I know this is very, I mean, this is like interviewing prep 101, but I also think it's important to call your attention that you, you need to be spending some time to interrogate yourself. And so every time I get ready for a coaching session with one of the people that are in my job search boot camp who take advantage of these coaching sessions, and, and, and usually they seek my advice for a couple of reasons. One is strategic and one is tactical. So, hey, Andy, I'm not sure where I want to go. I'm having some trouble deciding on my career path. I'm, I'm having a little trouble with pursuing something. How would I do that? That's one set. And then the other set is, hey, I've got an interview on the line. Hey, I've got to give a presentation. Hey, I need to negotiate a salary or multiple uh, offers or something like that. Well, the people that fall into the latter group that are interviewing, when I say, okay, well, you got an interview, give me the job description or tell me what the job is. 
so that we make sure that when you go into the interview, you have no weaknesses, meaning no blind spots, no they're going to catch you off guard, no they're going to they're going to surprise you with something or anything. And we go through that. You should you should think about your interviews that way. So I know a lot of you you practice, well here I want to say my perfect stories this way. What you're generally practicing for are the softball questions, the ones you know you're going to get, the ones that I've already highlighted in here, the ones I've shot the videos for, the ones that are on my YouTube channel. Yeah, that's the easy part of the interview. You win the interview when when they throw a curveball at you and you knock it out of the park. So you need to do a little bit of interrogating yourself to do that. So I want you to make sure, just to recap this little portion, when you get into the spot where you lack the expertise, you want to... You explain where you are, what you do. You want to talk about what you are, not what you're not. And then you want to get them over whoop, to the future, right? Let's talk about how I would do that because that's obviously important to you and you raise it, which is a great point. I, I've, you're right. I've managed two groups, right? Not eight, but here's the way I manage those groups and here's the way I would manage those eight. Why don't we talk about that, right? Get them, move, get them moving into the future. So this, this is a really good way to do it. And just as a reminder... You want to be ready for anything. Just do, do a little interrogating yourself. All right, I hope that helps because I know a lot of you guys are facing that stuff. And so I just I wanted to call your attention. Raphael, that one's for you. Uh, and uh, I already said, I already, I love you so much. I already sent you the link. I already sent you the link in advance of where your answer was going to be. So I hope you enjoy that. Knock that one out of the park and tell them you can manage 80, 80 satellite groups, not just not just two. All right, hope hope you enjoyed that. Let's take some Let's take some questions here. Uh, how are we doing on uh, on my questions? Let me see. Hang on, I got multiple chats going, and uh, I have to make sure I get this right because I, you guys get in this so early, and uh, I don't always get the the chats before eleven o'clock. Uh, but great to always great to have you guys. Love Thursday live officer. Hey, if you're enjoying this, I always say this later in in the in the session. Click the like button. Share this video. We're gonna be on for an hour. People need help. People need help. You don't need to keep me a secret, right? Like, just let them know. I just plenty of me to go around. Uh, also, follow me on Instagram. That's my favorite platform. That's where I got the most stuff. And uh, that's where you get the most help. Aside from these good shows. All right, Ahmed. I'm doing great. Wonderful to have you from Kuwait. Working in a bit exchange company located in Kuwait. I've been there four years. And actually, I want to ship my career to a senior accountant. Lots of luck. I don't see a question there. Uh, Stacy is telling me people want to know why now is the best time to search. Okay, you know what? I want to. I do want to take that. I do want to take that. All right. <clears throat> Here's what happens. And remember those 350 companies I was telling you about, right? The consulting and all the recruiting and all the stuff. Okay. So for 30 something years I've been working. So I've seen the three up and down markets. I've seen this i've seen this i've seen cratering doesn't make any difference it doesn't make any difference what is happening in mass as far as markets employment markets stock markets and whatever most companies and when i say most we're talking about 99 percent. most companies uh follow this pattern where uh and and while not all companies are on a fiscal year that coincides to the calendar year, meaning they run January to December. Most of them do. Yes, there are companies that run April to April. Yes, there are companies that run June to June, right? We don't need to get in the argument that that's a possibility. Of course that happens. But, but most organizations, regardless of the market, they're mentally wired and, and from a budgetary standpoint wired and from a recruitment standpoint wired, they go January to January. Every October, what happens is a lot of them, not all, a lot, they go into evaluation mode, planning mode, looking at the year, wanting to finish strong. We got a couple more months. We got to finish up the projects and all that good stuff. What, what does the next year look like? So say 2021. Okay, what's that going to look like? How much do we need to budget, right? Because they have to figure out what their projects are and all of that good stuff because they have to go through appropriations and all that good stuff and the com committee meetings need to meet and they have to get sign off from their boss and that stuff doesn't happen overnight and it certainly doesn't happen in a meeting or during that month. And then what happens is all that stuff that gets all situated through the end, through the end of the year. 
Now, in November, when November rolls around, what happens is they realize, okay, well, we, we know we're going to have to recruit for people to start in January for our new projects with our new budgets and all this other good stuff, and they probably have some pretty good visibility to what that is. Well, recruitment doesn't happen overnight. It's not like they come in in January 2nd, and then all of a sudden they're able to find and find and hire the people on January 2nd. No, they've only basically got eight weeks starting now until the end of the year, and they don't even really have eight weeks because... They're out on vacation for Thanksgiving and Christmas and whatever other holidays that they're that they're celebrating. Not everybody's there. So what they do is they go into panic mode and then they start they start elevating their recruitment. This doesn't even get into the fact that people retire at the end of the year. They call it quits, right? All that good stuff. And what else happens? People leave. And employers know that people are going to surprise them in January and leave. So not only do I have to hire for the people that I know I need, I have to start getting a pipeline together for people that I know are going to leave that I don't know who specifically is going to leave, but I need to make sure that this thing is up and firing and all that good stuff. Now, why should you be taking advantage of it? Because everybody who's not watching me right now thinks that employers mail it in at the end of the year and nothing could be further from the truth. Okay, so then a lot of empl- a lot of uh, job seekers think well I'll just you know maybe I'll kick the you know my resume in order I'll kick some tires but I I'm going to kind of dial it cuz nobody's really going to be there all right well that's why you need to be putting the accelerator down getting yourself in order and making sure that you know what to do how to start reaching out to people and all that good stuff not to mention Networking is going to be so vital for a lot of you. This is a great time just to connect with people, right? Reach out to people who you've been wanting to talk to, start getting engaged. It's just a wonderful time for all that engagement to occur. Look, employers are going to be hiring. As a matter of fact, I circulated something on my YouTube channel a couple of weeks ago. We, I had people commenting they are recruiters. They said, this is exactly what we're going through right now. We're, we've just elevated all of our recruitment efforts. So... This happens. Don't mail it in. So the reason I'm having the five-day job search challenge November 16th through the 20th this year is I had it the same week last year. I think it was the 18th through the 22nd. Uh, you know, we had the leap year and the days move a couple days, but it's, it's, it's really important. And I'm going to be showing you during that week uh, some of the messaging that I've been getting this year and last year what was happening for people who were getting engaged who were shocked at how much response they were getting to their messages believe me when i tell you this is the best time because employers need to have you in the seats in january november december january and 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 february too are the best months to jobs and i don't say that every month october's the worst month statistically to get a job now i'm sure some of you got jobs I know a number of you got jobs, and I know a lot of the boot campers got jobs because I get the emails every day. But I'm telling you, now is the best time to search. It is. It it just, it is. And if you want a little more on this, uh, last November, I cut and clipped a video that went out. I believe it was November 27th, the video came out about why now is the best time to job search. And I literally think it is titled, Why Now is the Best Time to Job Search. If you want to check that out, there's more color in there. But that that's why. Uh, it's every year. It doesn't make any difference. It doesn't make any difference. It doesn't make any difference. <laughs> every year. Every year. That's what happens. And And wait, let me throw one more on there. And even those companies that go April to April, May to May, June to June, whatever, they know that people are very mobile at the beginning of the year. So they raise their recruitment efforts because they want to snag the, the, the people who do not look throughout the year but tend to look at the end of the year, right? Because I'm not happy I didn't get my promotion. I'm not happy I didn't get my raise. My company didn't, you know, uh, the corporate bonuses weren't there and all that good stuff. So they try to snag people. I, I was consulting for a, a, a construction company we, construction company, May to May. is May is their big season. We started looking for people in, in, in January because they wanted to beat the rush, right? We know we want to pluck them now. So that's just another example that goes to show you uh, that, that regardless of what the, where the fiscal year is, now is the time. It is the time. Anybody who tells you to mail it in, that's just flat out wrong. So I hope that helps. All right, let's get back to... 
to the questions. Jason Lalonde, good morning to you. Want to thank me for all the help I've offered. You're welcome. The book interview intervention was spot on exactly how the recruiter asked his questions. Okay. The book is free. I'll send it to you anywhere. It's for seven bucks. Basically, the envelope cost me a couple bucks. The service fees cost me the number of bucks. The warehousing inventory fees cost. That's basically what you're paying for. And then I ship it to you anywhere in the world. Grab this. It's it's a lifesaver. It really is. And you get a bunch of other stuff. Kim Brody, how are you? Rasha, my boot camper. Yes. Hi, everyone. Andy, Karen, Stacy. I hope you are well. We are for my first day on the job. That's a boot camper who just crushed her job interviews. Should I prepare questions? Be on the lookout for something specific. Rasha. You are in the leadership program because I gave you a free year of that. Go to the Career Accelerator program and check out the first 90 days module. All right, let, let's get on to your next question here. Do you, do you do any specific rituals when you started a new job on your first day? First 90 day module, go grab it. Medina, how are you? Adam Stark, is there a difference between company culture and environment? I'm trying to figure out what would be suitable for me apart from the common ones? I don't have much of a clue what different types there are. Forget the, forget the fancy words like culture and environment. What are the personality traits, characteristics of the type of company that you want to work for? Just write them down. Don't over-engineer this. Make a list. Is it open and welcoming? Is it political or apolitical? Is it hierarchical or meritoc meritocracy-based? Right? Is it an open environment? Is it not? Is it fast moving? Is it slow? Is it just anything to describe the environment? Forget the, forget the nomenclature. What are the personality traits? Ask your questions related to that. All right, Laura Cobb, great to see you. John, is it finally? God, it's so hard to see. I guess all this glare. It's so funny. My, my softbox lights are like literally like six inches from my face because it's so bright which is kind of nice. I think it's like 70 degrees out. Uh, John, as I send out resumes, I am getting calls from HR people who ask, is now a good time? Is it better to take the call or should I ask for an appointment so I can prepare and print the job descriptions and have the resume? Okay, so number one, I need to ask Stacy. Uh, I know I've got, I know I've, I've clipped this. I know I, Stacy. I know I clipped this. Uh, do we, do we have it for him? Maybe it's on Instagram. So, John, I'm going to tell you, uh, I do have a video on this, but very quickly, if anyone ever calls you in the middle of the day and you are not absolutely ready, you need to get off the phone as fast as possible. The longer you are on the phone, the worse it is. Okay, so I would never, under any circumstances, take any phone call. You could pick the phone up and say hello and say, Oh, I'm so glad you called. I'm right in the middle of something. Can we set a time? I would love to talk to you. That's it. Get the time and get off the phone. Okay, do not, do not let them suck you into, wait, I just have a question or two. Wait, it'll only take five minutes. Wait, I only need 15 minutes. None of that. Do not speak to them. Just schedule the time. You will never do as well as when you are prepared. You are totally flat-footed. You have nothing in front of you. Right, you don't know what to ask them. You probably can't even remember who they are. You probably sent a lot of applications. Like, don't just get off the phone as fast as possible. Okay. Uh, normally, I don't even, I won't even pick the phone up unless I know who it is and I'm expecting the call. But in your in your case, I recognize that you want to, right? You want to catch the call and you want to make an appointment with them. Get off the phone as fast as possible. It it will do you no good. To get on the phone. Just be excited. Thank them. Tell them you were so glad to hear from them. Do not, do not ever double take it. Meaning, who's this? Uh, where are you from? Like any of that stuff, like your reaction needs to be, oh my God, thank you for calling me. I'm so glad you called. Right? It's but what happens? You, you applied to 100 places. You don't remember where you applied. You can't even remember. Half the time you're going through Indeed, you don't even know who it is, right? So just get off the phone fast. So that's, that's my, my view on that. 
Spider, you say title doesn't matter in one of your videos, but it does in the government industry. Okay, I'm okay with that. My manager was a political appointee. I did his work, but didn't have the title. Can I use his title or working title on my resume? Okay, so first things first. In 99% of the world, the title doesn't matter. In some cases, it does, and some people care about it. Most don't. The most important thing about you and your resume is, number one, you never use a title that is not your title unless you clarify what you're saying. So my preferred way to answer your specific question is use your actual title and then underneath in the description of what you did, you can say performed whatever activity such as or use the nomenclature of what your boss's title was or supported and then his title or performed and then his title activities such as something like that but don't label on your resume your title if they do any kind of verification where it ever gets back to could you give me his name rank and serial number and it doesn't coincide to what's on your resume you're going to have a problem so if you want to you want to clarify that that's okay but don't lie so just be really careful there Flying Uber Tuber, nice to see you. And Salma Boot Camper, great to have you. Laura Cobb, what are the five best confidence leadership tips you have for effective public speaking? How achieve each ways to work each tip? Okay, uh, that's a f hour long session. I'm going to give you a couple of quick tips uh, that I feel are most important when you speak. And it could be like this. This is public speaking. It could be on a stage. It could be in a webinar. It could be in a meeting. The most important thing, number one, is to remember if you are the one speaking, you are the one serving. So the most important thing is it's about them, not you. So that's my way of saying if you need to get over your fear, right? There, there's no such thing as fear of public speaking. That's what we call it but that's not what it actually is it's fear of i don't want to look like a boob right like uh, like i i i do not want to look badly right that's that's what it is and so it's it's it has nothing to do with your ability to speak right so so number one it's about them if you think about them then you won't worry about how you look right so that's the first thing the second thing is you need to think about what it's like to be them so what's it like not to know what I know? Okay, so what's it like not to know what I know? I need to make sure that I'm, I'm uh, phrasing it, I'm explaining it, they have what they need, and so on. So that's the, that's the, that's the vernacular. Then there's the structure, right? Wrapping it in a story. So first things first, then second, then third, then fourth. Managing their expectations of what they're going to hear making sure that they are engaged, so but they know they have context. So you're making it easier for them to listen to what it is you're saying. Okay, so, so, so think about, all right, I'm going to tell you five things, and I'm going to make sure that you understand why we have this issue, how we're going to solve it, what the mistakes are you're going to make. And so, so, so what, what you're doing is you gave them a map of what you're going to say. They are following the map, and they know exactly where you are. So they know where you are in the story, it's easier to remember. They have context about why they're listening, it's easier to remember. They know what it is that they're going to gain, it's easier to remember. So you, you are reducing the number of questions in their mind so that it, it's, it's very important. I think another thing, even before you get into the frame of what you're going to tell them, is making sure that you are getting them in the right emotional state that you want them. So it's called priming. Right. We, actually, you were in the leadership stuff when we went through this. You want to prime them appropriately. Then, then once you prime them, then you want to, want to frame what they're going to see and how it's going to help them. But those are the kind of things that I would do, and I would make sure uh, that your energy level is high. So that, that's five for you right there. I, I hope that helps. Uh, remember, you just it isn't about you. It's about them. All right. Sal. Uh, experienced some ageism this last week. Nothing to do, right, Andy? Can't prove, uh, can't prove, so go back to feed the funnel. So, uh, yes, I, I, 
I, I do want you to look at my ageism video, the one about ageism in a job interview. Check that out. Hey, Beth, how are you? Catherine? So, Catherine, did, you, did the interview go well, the one where I popped up right before you were going to, going to do that? Bob, how are you? Paula, great to see you. Andy, you are, what is that? Oh, hold on. Slip of hand. Where'd that go? Hang on. Sorry. You are my guru. Good news after nine months. Have a great job offer and waiting until next week for a possible second offer. Insane but true. Your teachings are the reason why. So big thank you. You are welcome. I think you are in Portugal, maybe? Let me know. I think that's right. Good for you. I'm so I'm so happy for you. All right. Beth, when do you recommend pulling out of an interview process? I think I have info about pace of work culture to know it's not for my, my number one need. Could investigate more and practice interviewing thoughts. Okay, so a couple of things. I would never recommend pulling out of anything until you are absolutely, positively, 100% sure that that is not for you. And it has to be systemic, meaning I'm interviewing, I discover the role is not for me. So the company's good, I just don't like this role. You keep going all the way to the end, okay? You never bug out. If you determine the company is not for you, no matter if they made you the CEO or not, and you're absolutely sure, like you've seen enough, it makes your skin crawl, you can't deal with it, I would bug out right then. I would not waste any more time. You do not need to practice interviewing. You are better off spending your time looking for other organizations that you would rather be with. That's what I would do. So my answer is that could be in the first five minutes or more likely after you've had enough data to to uh, to determine that. I to just you, I wouldn't pull out prematurely. I would be absolutely positively you will never look over your shoulder certain kind of thing. That's what I would do there. Tony P, my boot camper and leader from Dunedin. Miss you, buddy. Mike Rose, great to see you. Dana, how you doing? Catherine. B, good to hear that, that your interview went well. So happy for you. Paul, great to see you. Ludmila, how are you? C. Mitchell, Ed H. Joshua, hi to everybody. Rose, Pablo C., good to see you. Raphael, I hope that was, I think that might have been for you. I'm not 100% sure, but hopefully you got your answer. Terry from Georgia. Rochelle, Huntington Row, great to see you. Frank, Candida, Tyler, Lee. Oh, you guys are great. Bonnie. Let me see. Maybe I can get over to my other chat. Maureen. All right. Brandon. Okay. I think think I'm there now. Flying Uber Tuber. Okay. What do you say if the company went out of business a couple years after you left? Uh, I'm not sure what do you mean on your... uh, on your resume, you don't say anything. In an interview, you say the company went out of business. That's it. I would not, I'm not sure what, uh, don't overthink that one. All right, Santosh. Okay, I do want to talk about this. Uh, is it okay to accept LinkedIn invitation from unknown people? So somebody sent you a connection request. It's entirely up to you. Here's what I do. I am what's called an open networker. Some people think that's a great concept. Some people think it's a terrible concept. This is my view on it. And forget that I'm a a career coach or that I was a recruiter. I appreciate the value of networking. If there is somebody that I do not know that would like to connect with me, I do not see any reason why I cannot connect with that person. And if that person is professional, my guess is they value being connected as well. So if you come to me and you say, Andy, I, you know, right, Santos, I see, Andy, I see you're connected to Julie over there. And I don't know Julie, but I'm connected to Julie. Would you introduce me to Julie? I would say, sure. Send me what you want me to send to Julie. Hey, Julie, hope you're well. 
Just wanted to let you know, one of my connections was interested in meeting you. Assuming since we're connected, because I don't know you, right? I wouldn't say that, but since we're connected, you value the, you know, the the power of, of networking and the relationships. You know, I wanted to send this along and leave it to you guys to go and do whatever you're going to do, right? Kind of thing. If, if all of a sudden I start getting stalked by people selling me stuff, things I don't want, then I, number one, politely say to them, hey, I'm happy to be connected. Please don't send me. I don't need that kind of thing. And if they continue to do it, which is what a lot of them do, then I just block them. That's the way I treat it. I don't really care. I don't spend a lot of time thinking about it. Now, I, if I was a, now you, you talked about accepting the connection request. That's entirely up to you. That's my philosophy on it. It doesn't hurt you until it hurts you. When it hurts you, you break, you can break up with them online kind of thing. Now, would you, should, would I recommend you sending connection requests to people that you do not know? I would not. I would recommend you opening up relationships with some kind of message to them to say, hey, I'm reaching out, would love to connect with you in some kind of in-mail if you would be open to it or if you'd be open to connecting or video chat or coffee chat or whatever. Or, hey, I'd love to you know, get pick your brain on or whatever before you actually just send them a connection request. That's my recommendation. So I just, I think it's better uh, to have what we call permission-based marketing effectively. You're not marketing, you know, your services, but I'm talking about you're marketing you. So that's the way I, I feel about that. I've talked about this in no less than a dozen videos. So so check out my, my YouTube channel on this, uh, and I think you'll find a lot more. That's my thoughts on that. Let's see. James Ford on LinkedIn. Great to see you guys on LinkedIn and Facebook. Kristen, Shoni, Mitch, Sony, Shoni Newell. We, have, we actually have a Shoni Mitchell too. Tom, how are you? My boot camper. David, Shoni, LinkedIn user, Joanne. John Bailey, my boot camper. Please fix the volume on LinkedIn. I don't believe that there's anything wrong with my volume anywhere. I'm echoing? I should not be echoing. Is anybody else having echoing issues? Stacy and Kara, can you hear me echoing anywhere? If I was, no, all that stuff is off. Shouldn't be echoing. Buzzing through. Lindsay, how do I best display promotions using your resume template? I have five employers listed. Okay, hang on. Let's get to this. All right, Lindsay, how do I best display promotions using your resume template? I have five employers listed and was promoted with four of them, trying to keep the resume down to two pages. So, uh, well, how many promotions do you have with each employer? If you have five employers, uh, it's not like you have to have a half a page for each employer. Now, there's a couple of ways to do this. And I'm not going to be able to hit every permutation and combination in one little segment. I want you all to figure out what markets you best as you lay your resume out. Showing that you had career advancement within each section or employer behooves you. Okay, that works to your advantage. Now, there's different ways you can show that. Company, let's try this. Company, title, right? Title, title, right? Analyst, senior analyst, grand poobah senior analyst kind of thing. Or if you're starting to, now, that I, that is what I would do for the more recent ones. Then if I got, let's see, you said uh, five employers, maybe employer one and two, I show it that way. In employer three, four, and five, if I have all of them on my resume, I do not know how long you've been working or any of that stuff, I might say, underneath my most senior title, like what the last one was, promoted from analyst to senior analyst to grand by analyst, blah, blah, blah. You just write the story inside underneath the title or underneath the company. Large semiconductor, you know, largest semiconductor manufacturer in the world, blah, blah, blah. Held three positions, including this, this, and this. And so on, like, I'd say in six words, right? So, so how much real estate did that take up? Not much, but it's on the page. And they're going to be more concerned 
with your recent activity. Okay, now, if you're somebody who has uh, not so many years of work experience, you can flush it all out. If you're somebody that's working for 30 years, you don't, you don't have to do it that way. So there's a, there's a lot of different ways you can do that, but it's about how do you tell your story in aggregate. Okay, hope that helped. Christy Gleason, how are you? Okay, I'm not exactly sure what this is. All right. Rula, is it Rula? Hi Andy. What is your advice on how to say no? No for a bad payment, more free tasks or favors, extra working hours. So, uh, I do I do uh, I do understand what a struggle this can be. I'm assuming you're a business owner or a freelancer or a consultant or something like that where you are offering your services and they are they are not paying you or they are asking for more or there's scope creep or however you want to articulate this. I genuinely believe philosophically people treat you how you coach them to treat you. Now, I recognize that your conditions under which you're operating are going to be unique to you. However, I do believe that we all have a choice in everything we do, the employers we go work for, the vendors we we partner with, the you know, however it is, who we offer our services to and so on. That has to be established up front. It's important that this is the scope of what I'm going to do. These are how many hours I'm going to give you and this is when things will be done and and so on. That has to be set up front. If if they're pressing upon that, then what you need to do is you need to be explicit the first time. You, because remember, if you if you if you are inconsistent in the way in which you respond to them, meaning, okay, I'll I'll work those extra hours at free of charge. Well, then you you're establishing a pattern or a protocol. Or, or standard that they are now going to continue, right? And so, so you need to, you need to say, okay, look, I mean, we 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 talked about this. I'm happy to do this. Um, I want you to either I, I I can't do that. We need to you need to pay me, or we we need to raise the rate, or we need to whatever. Or I'm willing to do that, but starting on that day or next month, then what I'm going to do is we're going to recalibrate this, and we're going to raise the rate, and you can have a little more latitude or whatever. I generally, I generally, when I say no, depending on the situation, will at the moment provide alternatives. So instead of just saying, no, I'm not going to do that, I would probably say if somebody came to me and said, hey, would you, would you add that to your plate? Say, tell you what, uh, let me ask you this. Obviously, this is important that you're asking me to do this. If I do this, that means there's something else I cannot do for you because that's going to take me 10 hours. So we could do a couple things. Either we can remove something and I and replace it with those 10. What would that what would you like me to do there? Or we can add this and you can pay me and I'm just happy to do it. Or now you are turning it back to them. I just said no to you, but I didn't say the word no. That's another way you can do it, depending on who it is and depending, right? So I just got done telling you in the, in, the, in the little package we did earlier about all those companies that I managed. Well, wouldn't you know it, when a company's paying you zillions of dollars for you and your consultants and a team you're managing, a major project that's taking a very long time, it's very easy for them to add more and add more and add more. So my automatic response to anything was, okay, you need something else. Uh, tell you what, we take this out, we can add this in, or you know what, you've been such a great customer uh, that I'm going to do that for free, but I want you to know this is a gift, right? Like, I'm going to do it this one time, right, kind of thing. So my best way to say no is either say no, it's done, depending, or you give them choices, which are no and no. It's no, I'm not going to do that, You're gonna have, but you have options, you have alternatives, and that really, to me, is the best way. 
it, 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 it works. It really does. It really does. I don't know if you saw uh, the package I did with Maxim. I, I, a couple of uh, weeks ago, I put a video out there. It's about nine minutes or so. And uh, it was about when you need to ask somebody for something and you don't want to let them say no to you. That's the reverse. I'm not going to go into the reverse. I packaged it all up for you. It was actually a cutout uh, from one of my uh, multi-hour leadership coaching sessions. So, by the way, uh, I hope you guys recognize that anything I tell you always has a counter move. So, so you need to know that depending on when you are the requester. So check check that out. I hope uh, and I hope you enjoy that. And lots of luck. Uh, I think it's Rula, um, but I hope I hope that helps. Remember, moves and counter moves. Daniel Venditelli, my boot camper, how you doing? Roger Moore, I always love to see you. Joe Tracy, Joseph Tracy. Why is it the best time to be searching? I told you that. My guess is Stacy probably saw that. Uh, Kara's telling me. Uh, Heather, fresh Heather Steiger. My boot camper. Hi, Andy. I'm happy to report I begin my new role on Monday as director of digital marketing and analytics with a nonprofit. I emailed my story a few minutes ago. Oh, fresh. <laughs> Heather, I won't forget what you do. Uh, I love it. I love it. Big congratulations to you. Hey, can I? All right. Public service announcement here. Uh, I mentioned. Wait, Heather, that's awesome. And uh, if you would like, if you would like a success story like Heather's, uh, two, two things. I mentioned that I have the Job Search Challenge coming up. It's really fun. Monday, we're going to be talking about the blueprint of the Job Search Challenge, and it is all about bringing yourself to market. On Tuesday, the 17th, we're going to be talking about how to identify the right organizations. On Wednesday, I'm going to talk with you about how to identify the people in those organizations on Thursday, I'm going to teach you how to write the messages and the content that needs to go into your messaging, your networking messaging, your targeted messaging, your cover letter messaging, and all that good stuff. And on Friday, uh, Friday's the, the longest session, in fact, I'm going to run through all the problems you're going to have and how, right, moves and counter moves, right? So how do you overcome that? Now, that's the whole week. App, so it's 90 minutes a day. It's like two hours on on, on Friday. That's like eight hours of coaching. It's free. There's no catch. However, if you want extra coaching, more private group coaching, breakout sessions, uh, you know, bring bring your bring your liquor. We'll have call it a boot camp or happy hour. There's going to be private group coaching sessions for the boot campers only. Immediately following uh, the, the the midday sessions for the job search challenge, and then I also have another multi hour session with the job search boot campers, the private group coaching on Wednesday right before Thanksgiving. So that's the 25th. It's loads of coaching. It's a great opportunity for you to get in the boot camp right now, go through it. You'll get the job search challenge as well uh, immediately, but um, but it's really a golden golden opportunity for you to get in now. It's on special until the 25th. So I'm 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 not kidding. I think I'm live something like 20 hours that week of the 16th and uh and then even a little bit uh the week of thanksgiving so so i hope you jump in hopefully you'll get a success story like heather's and all the other boot campers that have been really successful lately lee alexander how are you and welcome to the boot camp didn't know we could submit questions yes you can of course you can lee go through the welcome videos and i tell you exactly what to do, how to do it, how to get the best service, where to get me, how to get me, the fastest way to get me, all the mediums you have, and everything. It's just step through the welcome videos. They're all like two, three minutes, and it's it's but it's insightful and it'll help you get the best experience. Huma from London, Mo Trotter, how you doing? Sandro, oh man, look at that name, Carneludi. I, I love that. I hope I pronounced that correctly. From Switzerland. Lisi? Uh, <laughs> sorry. I'm so sorry. I love your channel. I'm an HR pro, manager, and HRBP. Lost my job. Haven't done. Uh, all right, wait. I, uh, I'm not sure. You, you said don't mention my name. Uh, let's see. Sorry. I can't. This is a public channel. It's a public show. 
All right, hang on. I, I don't want to put it up there because I, I think you're obviously worried about, uh, well, you're worried about something, but uh, lost, lost job due to COVID, working in customer service now in a call center in a huge, gov in huge government contractor, haven't done HR since March. Should I put that on my resume? Would it look like I'm going back in my career? No. Uh, here's, here's what I would do. Uh, in your career profile, at the, the last sentence of the second paragraph, uh, I would just say temporarily serving as government contractor in call center, blah, 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 um, you know, returning to human resources, returning as pre human resources professional or something like that. If you want to do that, if you want to call their attention to why that is, I am not big on explaining a lot in the resume. Also, people get what's going on right now. And the fact that you had to do something to make ends meet or whatever, you didn't want to have a huge, long, unemployed gap, that's okay. I, while I recognize that five, six, seven months uh, might seem like an eternity to you, in the overall scheme of life, it's a very short period of time in your career. And employers get that. And you're in HR, so you, I'm assuming you get that. But that's what I would do. My Gallup from Dallas, how you doing? David, hey to you. Patty, oh, it's your birthday. Oh, and all you want for birthday is a better job. Can we wish Patty a happy birthday? Patty, I won't use your last name because it's not up there, but happy birthday to you and, and, and welcome to the fully entrenched in your 50s crowd of which we both are. Congratulations and, and happy birthday and I hope you do get a job. Okay, this one I do like, April. All right, now. Okay, hang on. I see this stuff going on. Um, okay, hey, okay, stop the, stop the slacking for one second. Hang on, let me get, let me get caught up. Um, all right, April. What is proper for shaking hands during these pandemic times? Should we go for it or ask if it's okay? Also, do I shake hands before and after or only before or only after? And April, if it's me, I would not shake hands at all. And we may never shake hands again. It hurts me. I would love to hug everybody. Uh, and I've even talked about this in some of my videos about you know, etiquette, body language, building rapport and all that good stuff. But our times are different right now. And people, we don't know how somebody is going to construe or misconstrue something like that. And I generally would, not, well, if it's me, if you're comfortable, I would take my cue from whoever you're interviewing with. If they get up and extend their hand and you would like to shake it, then go ahead. If, you, if they do not extend it, smiling is great. Smiling works. Uh, it, people get it. So, uh, and it also depends on, you know, are they you know, you're all masked up? Are you sitting 10 feet apart or whatever it is? So I, I, I would not sweat this. I really would not. I, 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 smiling works. All right, let's see. We got Kara's telling me, T. Smith. Oh, my boot camper, yes. Hi, Andy. I landed my new role last week and start next Monday as Senior Director, Business Development. Really appreciate all your coaching and the boot camp. It really paid off huge. Folks, these are people getting jobs. So companies are hiring. Right now is the best time. And wait, we got another one here. Rob Laporta, good morning, Andy and team. Had two interviews last week and received a call for another. Such proves your statement that this is the best time of year for job search. Activity has picked up. Folks, I'm telling you, it's, I want to, I want to, okay, Rob, awesome, awesome. I'm sending you good juju. I, I do want to, I do want to throw one caveat in here. If you are snickering at me right now, uh, I want you to ask yourself, like, he, he's nuts, he, he's crazy. No, look, if you're shoving your resume in the applicant tracking system, so too are tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of other people. That is not the way we want you to work, which is why I'm spending five days with you on the Job Search Challenge in a week or so. So it, you got to know where to look, how to look, and how to approach these jobs. If in, I'm not saying it is a technical impossibility to get a job by applying through the applicant tracking system or putting it in Indeed or through these 
corporate websites, some of you will get your jobs that way. I'm saying if you want to give yourself the best odds, be most in control, proactive and deliberate, and have the best probability of getting responses to your inquiries, there are other ways to go about it. And you're going to have to do a little bit. It's going to, it's going to have to be uh, systematic in a process sort of way as opposed to systematic in a system sort of way. So just keep that in mind that it, it, it's not easy. It, it will, it's a virtual impossibility to get your job through the applicant tracking system with the current environment. You need to know how to look and where to look and how to approach it. And that's why you're hearing some of these testimonies. I, I, I'm sure I'm not even going get to get to all of them, but I really appreciate uh, anybody who is getting opportunities if they would share to offer encouragement to people who are, are feeling a little bummed out that they're not getting the traction that they want. So I just, I, I, I really appreciate that. I'm glad you guys share in those boot, you boot campers. I'm really proud of you. And I know you work the system and I know all three of you are working the system. So that's great stuff. <laughs> Kristen's birthday too? Happy birthday. Linda, my boot camper. There is a job posting. Okay, if there is a job posting versus no job posting, should I focus for, oh wait, I know I'm gonna like this question. Hang on, let's just get this up here so everybody can see it. All right, Linda, my boot camper, for those of you that don't know that Linda is a boot camper, is that if there is a job posting versus no job posting, should I focus first on those with an actual job or should it be more 50-50? Not doing ATS submittals anymore, things are really going well. Okay, Linda, thank you. I couldn't have timed that better for then my speech bubble still hanging out there. Okay, here's the way I would do it, Linda. I don't care if there's a posting or not. I want you going from your target company list. Posting, no posting makes no difference. I wouldn't even worry about 50, 50, 80, 20 or anything. Remember, I've told you this before. 20% of jobs are advertised, okay? That means that eight out of 10 jobs are not posted anywhere, that you don't know where they are. And, and sometimes you submit your resume or send your resume to somebody who doesn't know they need you, doesn't have a job opening, but would be willing to trade somebody out or maybe something's brewing. They don't have the official rec requisition yet. Linda, I don't care if there's a posting or not. You go after the people in the, inside the companies you want to work for. If there's a posting and you want to reference it, go ahead. If there's nothing that you can see, then you reference it the way I showed you. Don't worry about the percentages. Go off your company list. Company I want to work for most, go after first. Then the next most, then the next most, then the next most. And so on and so forth. On your way to victory lane. Good luck. All right. Yes, Lee Alexander Kara is telling you you can submit. Yes. Uh, okay, another mention about the boot camp. So you all, we, you come to this show, live show each week, and then some of you submit questions on my YouTube channel, and I do my best to answer the ones that I can. In order of priority of how I serve the world, inside the Mile Walk Academy system, the Job Search Boot Camp is a fully supported uh, Q&A system. So in addition to having all the videos and the sequence and the packaging and everything and the private group coaching, there are uh, areas within the system where underneath each of the educational videos you can or the postings, you can go and ask me questions. So if you're in, if you're on the interviewing subject and you got an interview question, you say, hey, I got an interview coming up on blah, blah, and I'm going to be meeting with such and such, and they told me this and that, and I want to know what I should do. That's what they asked me. And then I answer them in the system every day. Two times a day, I have splats on my calendar where I go in and do that. So Lee uh, and, and any of the boot campers, you know that to be true. If you're in my leadership coaching, that's true too. And if you are interested in the in the boot camp it's on special till the 25th i would it's really a, lo a lot of support all right so i see another question about best time jobs so i i i get why stacy wanted me to answer that uzoma from other side of the pond boot camper hope you're well if i'm sending a cover letter uh, let's just get this up here you're a boot camper let's get look at that handsome guy all right Hope you are well. I am. If I'm sending a cover letter, does it have to be a separate attachment to the email I send, or can the cover letter be the email itself? So actually, what I would do, uh, I would. Uh, so here's what I like to do. I would send 
if it is, and by the way, this is if it's cold. You can type your email as if it's a cover letter. It's okay to attach a separate Word document that is verbatim or almost verbatim to what your email said and then have your resume. The reason I like to do that is because if anybody actually, because here's, here's what happens. Let's say the hiring official forwards that to the recruiter, okay, HR person or whatever. A lot of the applicant tracking systems, ours when we had one, hit a button, zoom, it takes the, it knows, it's smart enough to know that's a cover letter because that's a cover letter, that's a resume. Import it in the system. And then the system will say something like, hey, we detected a resume. Do you want that to be the resume? That person who's almost primary resume? Yeah, boom, make that his primary resume. System takes the information, indexes it, does the keyword matching and all that stuff. And so I like to have the attached cover letter because if the applicant tracking system files your attachments, then it's in there. So if somebody else goes to the system, follow me people, right? Like I, I got his email, so I read the email. But that email got imported into the applicant tracking system. Now I'm Joe HR person or Sally executive, and now I want to look at what he sent. Well, I go into the system and I, oh, there's his cover letter there. So, right? So you guys don't know that that's happening, but that's how a lot of these systems will work. So, so that's why I like to do that. That's why I like to include it. And that's why when somebody says, well, I just typed the email. I just, the cover letter is the same. Okay, listen to what I just said. Right? So if I want to look at what his cover letter says, I can see the attachment. I can probably see the email too. But you know, each of these systems is a little different. You don't know. Don't worry about it. Don't take the chance. So that's how I would approach that. That's a great one, by the way. All right. I, well, you know what? I can, I am not sure how to pronounce your name. Is it Zemisla? Boy, I wish I wish I knew how to pronounce that. I, I I appreciate this question. What do you think about candidates who don't speak language of country where they apply for a job? Is speaking the local language prerequisite or ju or just a skill like other skills? So a couple of things. I number one, it number one, I if I'm interested in an opportunity, and I'm somewhat familiar with the language, I would probably go for it. We had a woman in South Korea, Rachel, a boot camper. She, in my job search boot camp, she moved to Germany, didn't speak the language. And she, and we were able to help her get a job in eight weeks. Okay, an executive job, big time, for a global insurance company. And she got a chief of staff job. Okay, so like, okay, so there, there are success stories and evidence that this can be done. And she did not speak German. And she was taking German classes like every morning. And she was job searching in the afternoon. It was pretty awesome. Now, when I look at somebody who can't speak the language, I also look at what is it that they are applying for. If you are a salesperson who is going to have a high communication uh, reliant position, it's going to be more important. Are you an engineer where you and I can communicate effectively enough and it's not imperative that... You know, it's like, sorry, it's just you and me talking, internal, internal, uh, you know, in the house stuff kind of kind of thing. Okay, maybe it's not as important. It, it just, it, it really depends. If you are um, doing a lot of external facing and the proficiency in the language matters, then yes, it is a skill that you are able to communicate effectively. And if you cannot speak the language, then that could hurt you. Now, every company is going to be different. I don't know what you do. I actually... This is the first time I'm seeing your name, so I, if you are new to the show, welcome uh, to the to the show and to the community. But I, that's how I would uh, think about that, and I think it is dependent on the type of positions that you are interviewing for, and who you're going to be communicating with. So take that for what it's worth. I hope that helps, and lot and lots of luck on that. I, I, it's great, great question. Mayana from South Africa, great to see you. LinkedIn user, my family and I are interested in relocating uh, across the country. What are some tips you can give me for searching out of state? I have a background in QA program management, but looking to transition into web development. You have two issues. One, the out of state issue is very simply answered by going to my video on how to get 
a job out of state or how to get an out of state job. That is literally on my YouTube channel. There are nine steps there. I would follow that closely. The second thing is you're looking to change careers, but not like wildly, wildly different. I would look at my career changer playlist and check that out. The other thing too, for those of you who are in the job search bootcamp, my premium program, or considering getting in the job search bootcamp, I have an entire career changer module. There are four stages and 12 steps to successfully changing careers. And you can't skip a step. I mean, it's like, and I've changed careers twice. So I've given you the methodology I used to do that. But I, I LinkedIn user, whoever you are, lots of luck on that. But but the assets are out there and, and I'm on my YouTube channel at a minimum. All right. So I'm interviewing the company. You are always interviewing the company. All right. How are we doing on time? Here we go. Hey, that's good because of COVID. Let's see. Huma. Hey, that's good. But because of off because of COVID, it's now a slim chance of getting a job. So a quick fix is like desperation for income. How do you solve that? So to that, I would say, so hold on, this is a little bit different. Uh, Stacy, can we get, can we get, uh, Huma, the, the video on, is it okay to take a part-time job or is it okay to take a temporary job or whatever we, we titled that. I have shot a video on this about getting a part-time job during these kinds of situations. This is a personal choice. If if you need the income, I would do it. We had a we had a person in the job search boot camp, Jeff, 53 years old, software sales person. He lost his job and was having a hard time getting a job, got into the boot camp, and while he was in the boot camp and studying, he took a job as a limo driver. Okay, so people do this, right? He was driving a limo, but like think about it, Uber, Lyft, those kind of things ended up getting a job with one of the most prominent healthcare software companies in the world. Took him a little bit of time, right? Because he then finally got in the boot camp. And then once he got in the boot camp, he got the right protocols and then he got his job. But he was he took a job as a as a limo driver. Kids in college, right? Had to make the mortgage payments, had to make the college tuition payments. There's not an employer out there that wouldn't understand that. So there's no problem with you doing that. And then it's just a matter of how you package that in your stories. I took a part-time job or I ended up taking an opportunity with an organization. It is a unique situation. I knew it was going to be a short-term opportunity. I'm interviewing with you now because I see you as a home kind of thing. Just explain it straight away. But yes, it's not a matter of solving that. It's about explaining that. And that's what I would do. And then I do, I do have a, a video out there for more details on this one. So I hope that helps. All right. Love this. Timeless Amore Photography. Are recruiter jobs a bad area to get into right now? Absolutely not. So that's, yes, I would get into a recruiter job if you could find somebody to hire you as a recruiter. Companies are hiring. They they are. Uh, you know, don't 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 believe. Uh, actually, statistically, companies are hiring like crazy. They are. And as a matter of fact, I know this is gonna sound ridiculous. They've never made it easier for you to get hired than it is right now. The reason people are having trouble is because you're going about it the wrong way, right? Shove your resume in the applicant tracking system. You hear nothing reach into the employers directly, you're going to have great success. And employers have made it easier because they've opened the candidate pool up and they're open to hiring people remotely. There's a lot more flexibility. They're willing to hire you remotely. They're willing to have you relocate over a longer period of time. There, there, there's so many accommodations that employers are making to find the right person. You need to get your resume in front of the right people. You need to do that the right way. And again, the job search challenge, if you get registered for that, you can stay with me all week and I'll show you exactly how to do that. Recruiter jobs are great right now. Companies are hiring. They need recruiters to help them for sure. All right. Cecilia Steen flooded my boot camera. Great to see you. Mo is triple loaded latte, ristretto style. What's the scenario? Uh, what's the scenario regarding relocation at the current pandemic situation? 
Okay. Rias, what's the scenario regarding relocation considering the current pandemic situation? Here is what I have found to be true. Organizations, again, are hiring like crazy. They are. They're more accommodating. They're allowing people to work remotely. We just had a, uh, a person in my job search boot camp, lives in Connecticut, Justin's his name, got a job in San Francisco and, or actually Pennsylvania, sorry. He had an offer in San Francisco too. And he, he has, he has, they wanted him to move in two months, but he negotiated two years because he has a child that's in middle school. He wanted the child to finish out. So companies will relocate you. They're willing to be more accommodating. That is what I'm finding to be the case. Or they're allowing you to work remotely or they're not requiring you to, to relocate. We had one person, uh, she was interviewing and she wasn't in one of the cities that the employer says, well, if you're going to work remotely, we'd really like you to be in one of these 10 cities and 11 cities or something like that. And she wasn't in there. And my, my going back and forth with her was like, ignore that. Keep going through the process, get down to the end, and then hash it out there. And if they love, love you, they're, they're not going to care if you live near one of the satellite lo locations, if you really have the goods of what they need. Companies, will, they'll make accommodations. That's what I'm finding to be the case. That's what I see. Go, 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 go out there and give it, give it a go. Hope that helps. Sky Taylor, good morning to you. How are we doing on time here? All right, let's see. Uh, my team is quiet, so that's good. Christine Chandler, great advice. One company I applied with wanted a person, uh, uh, a one-person position to take on three positions. I declined after this. It's totally true. Uh, you know, you got you got to be real careful. Like, are their expectations realistic? Let me buzz through. Giovanni Lombardo, hey Andy, how would you navigate job search plus development medical, developing medical circumstances? So I don't know what your uh, medical circumstances are, stress, energy, and appointments. So I'm, I'm, uh, I, uh, you know what? I'm not even sure what to tell you. Here's how I navigate my life. So I have medical appointments and all that kind of stuff. Tomorrow I got a whole day of battery, <laughs> battery of them. Uh, goes on the calendar. It is when it is, or I have my routines, or I have my appointments, or whatever. I manage my job search around that, or I manage my work around that. If you get an opportunity, and on Friday morning you have a doctor appointment uh, or, or any any treatment or whatever it is that you're you're dealing with uh, then you're unavailable I'm not I'm not really sure I'm not really sure how to how to, how to, how to answer that other than it goes down on the calendar you work around it all right I hope that helps all right all right this is I I, I didn't read the whole thing and I already knew I was gonna want to sorry about that all right here we go in your past as a recruiter, would you hire someone with a degree in human resources with relatable experience but no direct experience in that field? I would absolutely not. Uh, as an executive recruiter, remember this. As an executive recruiter, our companies are hiring us to go out and surgically find them the magic pill. Right, So we do not bring to our clients people who do not satisfy the major requirements that need to be satisfied. Now, if, if we're working for a company that is a business-to-business -business software as a service provider and I'm looking for a salesperson who does not exactly have business-to-business -business software in their background but is a software as a service technology salesperson, that person might go in because they have all the right other tools. And the other stuff is easy to learn. We have this expression, at least one that I use, that talks about uh, it's easier to teach the trade than the traits. Right? So I could teach somebody B2B. Okay, so that's pretty simple. Now, if you have a degree in human resources, to me, the, the education is 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 very much discounted. I mean, I could lie to you and say, "Hey, that's great." And education is is awesome, 
But if you're competing against somebody who has actual experience, you're going to lose. Okay, so what do, you, what do you do to overcome that? Well, if I'm trying to break into a field that I have a degree, I don't have the practical experience, I got to go in at the entry level. I'm not spending my time working with executive recruiters. That is going to be a complete waste of your time. A complete waste of your time. Do not contact them. Do not lift a finger. If, the, if somebody emails you, that's okay to call them back, but I would not spend one minute, not one minute, trying to contact recruiters. I would be spending all of my time trying to find organizations that were open to hiring entry-level people that don't have the requisite skills and look for them. I would also be leaning on my network to see if they could introduce me to any organizations that would be open to taking a chance on me. Do not try to spend any time convincing somebody that they need to hire you based on your degree. No one's going to no one's going to buy that. They're they're going to be the, the people who are going to hire you are going to be the ones that are open-minded to giving you a chance because you're coming in at the entry level and you happen to have some idea of what it is they need you to do based on your schooling. Okay, so be very clear about this. Your time is always going to be better spent looking for those types of organizations who are already open-minded. Do not try to convince somebody who's not open-minded. And maybe, Stacy, maybe we could pop out the video. I don't know what you titled it, but you know the one I want about uh, the top end of the, of the funnel, the marketing one, whatever you called it. Uh, I, would, I would pop that out and I would clarify that that's the one I'm talking about for timeless Amore photography. All right, hope that helped. All right, let's see. Catherine from the UK, how are you? Uh, can you post the whole video after you finish? Couple things. I want to put this up here. When when I do Thursday live office hours like this, uh, so it's on YouTube. That's kind of our primary home base, and then it's on LinkedIn and Facebook. I leave them up in all three areas. So whatever your pick your pleasure, go and look at whatever it is uh, that you wherever you prefer. And if you go to my YouTube channel, these regular Thursday live office hours are always up there. So these will, you know, they don't disappear. I just leave them up and you can go and catch them at, you know, whenever it's convenient for you. And so if you want to, you know, if you're making notes as we go through this and I, what I would do if I'm at the show and I'm, and I, and I happen to be responding to somebody and you like that answer, you want to go back, I would note, and it's 1228. Andy said that I'm going to go back to that on 11, five and I would make the note that way. It's the easiest way. All right, listen, couple things. Job search challenge, November 16th through the 20th. Don't miss it. Next week, Friday, so not tomorrow, but next week, I have my leadership monthly live group coaching session. I am covering networking. It's going to be awesome. I'm giving you all my networking principles, philosophies, tactics, strategies, and so on. If you are interested in that program, you can try it out for a month. You can jump in for half price for a year. It's really a great, great deal. Check check that out. Follow me on uh, YouTube it, to make sure you're getting the alerts to all my new videos because it hurts me when you don't get my new stuff and you don't come to the live shows. And also on Instagram, my favorite platform, I say that every week, connect up with me on, on, on my Instagram. It's really a fun it just it's a fun platform. I put a couple of inspirational quotes out there each day. I do a selfie video that I call today's tip that's on life hacks. I invite you into my life. I tell you stories about my childhood, my kitchen today, the one about uh, my wife dumping my au jus and how it applies to your life and all that's great fun stuff. And then there's a couple of uh, career uh, advancement and job searching videos, those career development videos. Uh, all that's every day. And then there's a few other little things that I put out there. But I always love to, to connect up with you there. Get connected with me on LinkedIn. If we're not connected, you're welcome to leverage my network. I always love to see what you guys are circulating and what your issues are. And, uh, and just I, I want to be there wherever you, wherever you need me, especially now. I was not kidding when I said now is the best time to search, which is why you are going to see me a lot, why I'm going to be available a lot to you, the public, and to, and to my job search boot campers. Uh, I want to make sure you're getting what you need uh, because you want to strike while the iron is is hot. All right. Hope that helps. Thanks so much for spending uh, an hour and a half with me. I'll see you, uh, let's see, Tuesday. I got a new video coming out. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. And on Thursday, I'll be back here 
for live office hours. And next Friday, I've got my leadership uh, group coaching session on networking and building professional relationships. It's going to be a lot of fun. All right, you guys be cool. I'll talk to you soon.